If you had to write a scouting report on Mr. Max Truly. Max Rolnick, what would <laughs> what would that scouting report say? Um, well, if I coach with fear over, then when I'm not in the room, they're going to do whatever they want. And in order for us to be successful, they have to be taking all the stuff that we've worked on and doing that outside of practice. So I know my first year, I uh, threw a player off the team because he laughed in the, the classroom after a loss. What's up, y'all? Welcome back to Shift Across the Border. My name is Max. I'm here with Chris. And today, after months and months of hunting him down, he would sometimes not even respond to my text messages, so I'd have to find him in person. We have on the head coach of Elms Men's Basketball, Coach Southall. I was welcome, do- finally, welcome. Thank you for making the time today. Thank you. I'm excited to be on. Are you excited to be on? Or are you more nervous than excited? I'm way more nervous. Uh, <laughs> as we discussed prior, need to make sure that my hair looks fantastic and I'm <laughs> Ready to roll. I was going to do the whole spiel thing I did with Sutter, but first of all, I absolutely f- shitted on that one in the episode. I did it terribly, so I just completely built. And I don't think that Elm's website is completely accurate. How many seasons have you been at Elm's? So I just completed my 10th. Okay, because it says five on the website, and I was pretty sure that was wrong. Yes, the, yes, okay, I just completed so, my 10th. And then it also says you had a stint at WPI before you came here. Yes. That's correct. That is correct. Okay, so before we go into the whole big college basketball scene and everything, I kind of want to know where you grew up and what your childhood was like and that kind of stuff right now. So I had an interesting lifestyle growing up. My parents were uh, educators at a prep school. So uh, Loomis Chafee in Connecticut. So I lived in a residence hall um, until I graduated from college. And I lived on either a secondary school campus or a college campus until I graduated. And then when I graduated, I did my, um, I went to undergrad at Springfield College. Well, you played, right? Uh, I sat the bench. Mm -hmm. Um, We're on the roster, though. uh, Yes, I sat my, I sat my, (laughs) I sat on the bench. (laughs) And then uh, my junior year, I had uh, got called into the coach's office. And he said, it's not looking good for your senior year. I think you should do something else. And I always wanted to get into coaching. So my senior year, I volunteered as the JV assistant coach for the Springfield College. Springfield College is the JV team? They did at the time. I don't know if they still do. And then I um, did my graduate work for Springfield College and was a GA there for two years. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, I went to uh, Bates College up in uh, Maine. Which is in the... NASCAC. Okay. Very good league. Yes. Like Trinity's Conference. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and then we, um, after that, I was hired as a full-time assistant at WPI. And I was there for nine seasons. And then I was lucky enough to get this position here at Elms College. So were you playing basketball growing up, obviously? Yes. And yes. what what did that really look like for you? Like, were you, you were a guard, yeah? Yes, I was a point guard. Did, did your um, parents play basketball or any sports? No. Uh, my dad did soccer and he did wrestling. So how did you um, get into basketball? So, you know, growing up, I kind of did kind of all the sports. So I did baseball, soccer, basketball, track. Um, and then... What did you run in track? So track, I did the 400 and I did the high jump. What was your 400 run? Uh, 400, I think my best was around like somewhere around 67, 60, somewhere around there. Do you know if that's good or not? I don't know. Yes. The 400 time. 67 seconds? Yeah. So that's like a minute and it's like seven seconds. Well, I know that, but I don't know if that's a good time. It's usually not. pretty good. Like, that's all right. Uh, I have a picture of me in high school where I jumped, I think my junior year, I cleared six feet on the high jump. Mm. Um, but that was a long time ago. And I was, you don't think you do that now? <laughs> no, I'm, I was, I'm like 40 pounds heavier than I was there. So, um, but... Yeah, I lost my chance out where. Uh, how did you end up in basketball? Oh, so, you know, growing up, we played all, kind of played all the sports. Mm-hmm. And my dad was an athletic director at the prep school. We did everything. And then I fell in love with basketball. I had, uh, went to Satch Sanders basketball camp up in, actually, at New England College. Oh. Where one of our teams in our conference. Uh, I don't know if you guys know who Satch Sanders is. Oh. All right, he was a famous Celtics. He played behind um, Bill Russell, all those guys. He won, like... 
eight or nine championships with them. Okay. So he used to run a basketball camp up there, and that's kind of where I fell in love with basketball and just, you know, kind of went from there. Was there a certain appeal or certain things about basketball that you liked more than the other sports? Because, like, for me, it's the the freedom aspect of it. I think it's more freeing than a lot of other sports because there's not a lot of restrictions in terms of what you can do as a player. Like, there's so much creativity you can do with the basketball and all this stuff, and that's what I sort of fell in love with. Did you have something like that? Yeah, I also like the, the chess mask chess match of trying to like figure out like how to get by your opponent, how to beat them, Mm -hmm. like what to do to, you know, kind of score on them. That was really um, appealing to me. And I really loved, um, so like I was a great passer back in the day and I loved to set up other people more than to score myself. So as of right now, I want to start with the first question, which is, do you feel pressure from fans, alumni, and administration to win? Well, I think, you know, pressure, um, I think there's always pressure in being a program. Everybody wants to win. Nobody wants to be a part of a program that's not winning. And, you know, there is pressure, but I'm only focused on what my expectations are and the expectations of the team. I can't let you know, outside influences dictate what we do. And at the end of the day, I'm trying to do what we think is best for the program. What were kind of those expectations going into the year this year? And then how do you think the team stacked up to those, I guess, expectations? I think our expectations for this year was a growing. We had um, a lot of new guys kind of come into the program. Mm -hmm. And I think we improved from where we were last year. So our um, when we lost six games this year by one possession or more, you know, which was better than the previous year, you know, we, um, you know, won more games than we did the previous year. So we are improving. I mean, obviously, we didn't set the world on fire, um, but we certainly were way more competitive in the league than we were the previous year, you know, so – we have to, you know, build that foundation foundation that we had and keep adding, you know, pieces. And so speaking of adding pieces, so last year brought in a ton of guys, a lot of new guys. What is kind of the plan for next year? Is it bringing in specific people or like what is your kind of thought process? And what, what are you looking for? you want to address? Well, we, we have to address our um, lack of strength and we have to address our lack of outside shooting. You know, I mean, we were somewhere ranked, I think, in the 300s of made three-pointers per game. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where some areas we're trying to improve. I mean, obviously, we're trying to add to our um, post players. You know, we are a little bit more limited in our post players than um, our guards. So we are trying to add to that. You know, unfortunately, at a Division three, you know, We're a little bit at the mercy of kind of the recruiting cycle. And, you know, obviously Elms is not the most uh, inexpensive inexpensive institution. So we have to go through the recruiting process and see who can afford it. And, you know, can they get accepted um, and go through that process? Mm -hmm. In terms of the guys you have now, specifically not maybe not naming people, but are there things you're doing to develop players on the team as of right now? So, yes, they're working with our strength conditioning coach, Coach Morgan, who's fantastic. She's amazing. Um, So they are working with her. And then we have given them some game-specific shooting drills to work on for this spring. I'm a big believer in game-specific drills. I don't think you can really get better just working – you get better working with no defender, but there's very rare times in a game where you're not going to have a defender. And you always have to read that decision and make you know, calls based on what the de- defender is doing. So that's why I want us working on that. Um, and we always have our green light drills that um, I think only TC was able to pass our green light drills this year. So our green light drills are our elite shooting drills that – our 1,000-point scores, our all-conference players have successfully completed. 
So those are always there for them to to complete and try to get better at. Could you maybe explain a little bit more what that is? Because I've watched them do that, but I don't know exactly what that drill is. So we have a, a probably about 10 to 15 green light shooting drills. And the the thought behind it is if you can pass these drills, I don't question your shot selection because you have proven that you are a consistent enough shooter that, you know, I think obviously all coaches – give their better players more freedom than some of their other guys. And so if you've consistently beaten these three point, the green light shooting drills, then I'm going to give you more freedom than somebody who just comes in and, and hasn't beaten those or just, you know, comes in and chucks. Sticking with the recruitment theme, what are some things that you look for, even like stepping away from the weaknesses aspect, just in terms of when you're looking at high school players and you're recruiting people, what are some skills you look for that are outside of athleticism and stuff like that? So the first thing we're looking at is character, you know, and I love to see how people respond in adversity. Um, you know, we are at a small institution and we need to make sure that we have the right people on the bus. You know, um, obviously we had some people that weren't exactly right for us at the beginning of the year and we ended up getting them off the bus. And I think trying to find people that are going to help us and improve that is, is critical. So when you're watching film, is that something you're looking for, like body language when they get subbed out of the game and stuff like that? Yes, and also, like, how do they react to, you know, their coaches? Um, you know, sometimes, you know, if, like, I'm watching the highlights, like, I'm not really trying to, you know, like, learn about their character and their, you know, response to adversity then. I'm just kind of looking for, you know, one, are they think they can they athletically play at our level? Can they shoot at our level? Can they handle it? Do they have an elite skill? And then, you know, once we've kind of said, yes, we think they have one of those, then we're doing more information and learning, you know, hey, what is this kid's background? What's he like? You know, we'll call the coach, ask questions, you know, ask them how can they, you know, how do they learn basketball? How do they pick it up? Like, you know, because I think, you know, you need players that can have a good bandwidth and learn you know, the plays, the defense. Do you go to games too to look at these things? Yes. So we go to a lot of games um, and we'll watch kids. Obviously dependent on, we are a little bit more locally based recruiting. So, you know, myself and the assistant coaches, we will drive out to most places and go to see kids play. You know, I've gone down to Florida, seen kids play at showcases, gone down to Maryland. We've done a lot. Um, with some junior colleges up in New York, you know, so I drove up to see Aaron and Key play. Um, so another aspect too of the recruiting process that I want to touch on because right now I'm training two kids from back in Canada and they're currently emailing coaches. And I'm wondering, you obviously probably get a lot of emails from aspiring players who want to come play here. Are there some mistakes or things that you think players should avoid when emailing coaches that you've seen personally? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, the most uh common one is making sure you have the right school. Okay. <laughs> I, I cannot tell you how many times I get an email and at the end it says, you know, another institution, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, even I've got one this year from a, a high school coach. It's so wrong, about wrong school. Kid that said, like, yeah. Like he was like, this kid's amazing. The best player like you'll ever have in your program. And you know, it wasn't our institution. <laughs> Uh, I can't remember the kid's name, but no, which school? oh, it was for Leslie. So he was obviously reaching out so to multiple schools, multiple, yeah. which as most high school coaches right. should for yeah. their guys. I think um, making sure that the videotape early on aspect like showcases something that they're they're good at. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a video and it's like a guy shooting a free throw which you know doesn't necessarily help me evaluate them in terms of their athleticism their skills you know so i think having that right away because uh, you know it's hard to watch a 5 minute video if the first minute they're just they're not doing anything to sure. to pique my interest um and i think just getting to the point in saying like, hey, this is what I'm good at. This is what I'm looking for. And then having their major too. 
Because I think a lot of times, like I'll get an email from a kid. I got one today from a kid who wants to do kinesiology and wants to transfer, but we don't have that. You know, so just learning a little bit about the school and what majors they have. Do you prioritize transfers over freshmen or is it more just a batch of kids that come in? Like which one would you prefer to have come to the program? So right now at this point, I like transfers because I think they are a little bit stronger. In terms of? Strength. Oh, just literal strength. Strength. And also they're more used to the three-point line. So, you ha- you know, high school, I don't know internationally, but in the U.S., that high school line is almost three feet shorter. Mm-hmm. So an elite shooter at the high school level is going to really struggle. Yeah. You know, I remember when the line moved back the first year, and it was like a 15% decrease in our shooting efficiency. You know, and so that's a huge thing moving when guys come for freshmen. You know, obviously a transfer coming in from a college, they've hopefully learned a basketball system. Yeah. And so they could, you know, they'll understand it. They'll be able to execute it at a quicker rate than a first year freshman. That's kind of what I was getting at too, is the idea of like a freshman needs that first year to really adjust and become accustomed to the idea of college basketball because it is so different from other forms of basketball. Yeah, and I think freshmen struggle with um, the transition of going from the best player who's taking the most amount of shots, who maybe doesn't have to defend because he co- his coach needs him out there to score to win. And so I think, you know, as a freshman, you're coming in and the coach isn't allowing you to do that freedom yeah. or you haven't earned that right – that's a tough transition. And I think obviously, you know, somebody who has been in a college program has already made that transition. They're aware of that. They have that perseverance built up and they can kind of, um, I think compete at a different level than a first year can. Um, How would you kind of quantify successes and failures? That's not just like winning and losing. That makes sense. Like how can you, I guess, define success success as a coach? Outside of winning and losing? So I think success as a coach is helping guys be successful and helping them get, um, reach their goals, whether that's on or off the court. I mean, you know, it's, I think it also develops into how connected guys are on the team. You know, like you can have, a team that is like an amazing record, but can't stand each other, you know? And I think having a team that's connected, that communicates, that is, you know, not causing issues in the residence halls and think, and graduating, getting great jobs. Like that is a successful season. So are there things that you try to do as a coach to sort of foster that sense of family and bring these guys closer together to get closer to that term of success? Yeah, I mean, we do some uh, kind of team building activities at the beginning of the year, you know, and then um, we try to do some of them in season, which I do a poor job of because, like, you know, we just get caught up in the season and, like, you know, hey – we got to have this scouting report done. We got to have the, these film edits done. You know, like, you know, you're like, all right, we don't need to do this right now. You know, we need to, you know, learn how we're going to defend LaSalle's five out offense, you know, and that takes a little precedence. Out of the season, um, we have game night every other night. I mean, every other, sorry, every other Wednesday, um, where we're trying to build connections and get guys. Too. Those have been really fun so far. Those have been yeah, really I was not real. I did not realize how um, inappropriate taboo was. <laughs> that was hilarious though, to watch that happen. Live. Okay, that was, that was. I think that was probably one of the most connected I've seen our team. <laughs> yeah, actually. yeah, but that I did not realize how inappropriate. I I stayed away from Cards Against Humanity mm-hmm. because that I knew one that would have been worse. Honestly. No, it was way worse. <laughs> so way I worse. I stayed away from that because I knew that was bad, but I did not realize how bad taboo was. <laughs> Now, watching that with no context was hilarious. Watching Jaden come into that. I'm not even going to try to mimic or explain what was going on, but it was <laughs> fucking hilarious. Yeah. Aside from the whole family thing, too, are there other ingredients that you think, because you've coached a couple of really good programs, what do you think the ingredients are of those really good basketball teams? So 
I think it comes down to kind of three areas, kind of attitude, your competitive stamina, and energy. And I think those are kind of three underlying aspects that are a part of any successful program. So do you... You, I want to kind of break those down a little bit more. So in terms of competitiveness, what exactly does that mean? Well, competitive stamina, right? So competitive stamina is how long can you compete without knowing what's going to happen, right? So, And I think that's really critical for teams that are building a foundation, right? Because I think, obviously, you know, if things aren't going well, people can shut down and be like, hey, you know, oh, man, I'm just – I'm not going to rotate on this possession. Like, I'm tired, like – they don't have my back. And I think having that competitive stamina to keep rotating, to keep going is critical to those, you know, building that foundation and becoming an elite team. Mm -hmm. Like if you watch like St. Joe's in our conference, like they had that competitive stamina. They rotated every time. They did all the little things that, you know, the teams that aren't winning aren't doing those on a consistent basis because it's hard to compete all out for 40 minutes and, you know, you still might lose. Is that something that you picked up from a coach sort of instilling that in you when you got your other jobs or is that just something you've witnessed coaching basketball? I think it's a little bit of both. I think it's a combination of also like, you know, kind of doing research and seeing what other teams do and seeing, you know, successful examples of other programs, you know. Did you have a favorite moment from this season? Oh, that's tough. <laughs> we could do your least favorite moment if you prefer that one. <laughs> I don't know about that one either. I don't like, I mean, honestly, like, I mean, the, my favorite moments of the team are when we come in and we celebrate a win and it gets crazy and there's nothing. You and Sam go up and body check each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Somebody. Somebody knocked, went, well, who knocked me on the ground? Like, Sam. This, it sounds but, like it would be Sam. Yeah. Um, I mean, those are always my, I think, sell, like, it's hard to win in college. Like, it's not easy. The GNAC is really tough. And celebrating those wins is really important. And I think guys, like, unfortunately, like, at some point, your athletic career will end. And you have to find ways to still celebrate wins when you get in the real world. And I think celebrating wins with a group of people, that is the most rewarding thing that coaches can do. So I think those are, you know, my highlights. Um, I mean, my least favorite moments, I think obviously are the losses. Like those, those all suck. I mean, I'm trying to think of what else. I don't think... We can move on. I mean, obviously, we had that the incident in the in the in the preseason. Yeah, that was a low point. I mean, in my ten years here, we had never had an incident like that, and we've had some knuckleheads here. <laughs> um, yeah, so that that was a low point. But I was going to go sidestepping off of that. I talked about this with Sutter on the last episode too. How last year at Madai, our coach was a stickler for turnovers. He would get, he would rage if we had a turnover, and that was his coaching pet peeve. Do you have a certain coaching pet peeve, whether that's body language or certain things that just irk you as a coach? So I can't stand giving up layups, and I can't stand guys missing rotations. Um, so like we track that. Like I like, so I have the numbers of like how many rotations guys miss in games, and like it it drives me nuts to give up layups. Like it's not that hard to just rotate. Like mm -hmm. you know what I mean. Like making a shot is different because. There's different – like, you can have a great shot and you just miss it, right? But it's not that hard to rotate and get your chest in front of the ball. It's, it's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. You seem like a very analytical person in terms of what I've heard about your systems and all the <laughs> stuff you have <laughs> built into the program. Uh, yes. I like to use data to help drive decisions because I think it will – it takes some of the bias out of it. Mm -hmm. And if I can make a decision, like, so we do a win, a percentage of win loss, you know, in practices. So we track everybody's win loss percentage and, you know, say somebody's crushing it and I'm not playing them. Like that gives me another reason to look at them and say, Hey, okay, maybe I think this person should play more. Mm -hmm. 
you know, or if sometimes like a, a kid comes in and is like, hey, coach, like I need to play more. And I'm like, well, you have the lowest winning percentage on our team. Like why, you know, like you lose everything. Like why, why should you play? I was going to say that it gives you sort of a background into like if some kid comes up to you and wants more playing time, you can say, well, this is all the evidence I have that you shouldn't be playing. And it gives well, you more ground to stand on. Yeah, but I think it's like, I think it helps. And I, and I obviously could be at it from a different point of view, but it helps take out, I think, the like, oh, my coach doesn't like me or these things. It's it's a little bit more like, hey, you know, like you lead our team in deflections. You lead our team in missed rotations. You lead our team in charges, you know, and it's easier to say, hey, you know, this is what you need to do to get better or look, you know, like obviously a lot of times athletes will come into coaches and they'll be like, I think I should be playing more than so-and-so. Mm-hmm. And I think with a system you can say, well, hey, so-and-so leads us in deflections you know, he's shooting 40% from the floor. You know, you have the lowest winning percentage on the team in practice. You average four turnovers a game, you know, and, you know, you're shooting 10% from the three-point line. So I think it helps from my point of view. I don't know how the athletes like it, <laughs> but it certainly helps from my point of view. Mm-hmm. One of the things I kind of went into, which is a more fun one, is if you had to write a scouting report on Mr. Max, really. Max Rolnick, what would, <laughs> what would that scouting report say? Um, and be brutally honest, please. I want to hear every every <laughs> ounce of everything. So, well, I guess it would be an internal or an external scouting report. So, when we do an, a scouting report for our upcoming opponents, we always try to highlight their strengths. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we don't ever want to like disrespect an opponent or or a player. Every time that. Every time that you have it happens, they go off crazy. Yes. So we want to obviously highlight their strengths. So our scouting report would be for Max, would be that he is a great three-point shooter. We need to make sure that we have early high hands on him and force him to put it on the floor off, you know, when he's offensively, right? Make him get to his left. You know, I'm a very big believer in – so I did a study three years ago, and I looked at the percentages of how well guys pass and score with their weak hands. And at our level, it is significantly different. So players are 10 to 15% less effective going to the weak hand. So we want to run Max off the three-point line and make him use his left hand to either have to try to pass with it or finish over a defender. Not a terrible strategy. Now, the fun part, defensively, what would you say? Defensively, we would get Max in um, what we call like our dog action. So we would have to make him defend in a double gap situation. So he would have to move his feet laterally and defend um, with space and not necessarily another defender to kind of help him guard the ball. I'm fouling. <laughs> Fell five of them. Huh? So you got five of them. Yeah. No, I would love to put you in a pick and roll with TC and just let him work, honestly. I actually stripped TC for a layup yesterday. I can ask him about Subtle it. Flex. Defense is getting better. Defense is definitely getting better. Mm-hmm. I feel like the guys in open gym kind of know that's what I need to work on. And so a lot of them are, like, getting switches on me. So I'll, I'll be guarding key on the perimeter, guarding TC. And the f- even, like, guys like Tajay or Ben. And at first I was giving up a ton of buckets. And I think as they've kind of – as it's kind of time going you. on, I've gotten better and it's kind of gotten away from – Get a pick and roll or get ISO on Max. And it's, I mean, obviously, it still happens, but I definitely think that that aspect is getting better. Mm-hmm. Looking at your early career, I kind of want to know what are some mistakes you think you made as a coach early on that you could help other coaches avoid in their early career? Um, so I know my first year, I uh, threw a player off the team because he laughed in the, the classroom after a loss. And he was a does not sound like you. He was a six seven. Logo? He was a six seven uh post player. Um, but you know, he had he had other issues. But I think so it was interesting. A couple of the guys that I've worked for for coaches, um, they were complete opposites of each other. And I think what I think when I first came here, the the you know, gentleman I worked for, uh Chris Bartley at WPI, um he was um, kind of like an older school coach, and I think I was trying to kind of emulate him a little bit more in my first couple of years than be myself. And I think guys kind of see through that. 
How exactly were you trying to emulate him? In terms of being like kind of like a like an old school yeller screamer, you know, I I don't think that's my personality. So I think <clears throat> in high school and coaching in high school and college is different. I think coaching in high school is a partnership. I mean, sorry, coaching in college is a partnership versus I think coaching in high school is more of kind of like, you know, you're the kind of dictator. And I think in college, like we have to be partners. And I think getting guys that want to do that, that want to do all the right things, because that's when you're going to be successful. If I coach with fear over, then when I'm not in the room, they're going to do whatever they want. And in order for us to be successful, they have to be taking all the stuff that we've worked on and doing that outside of practice. And I don't think that happens with fear over. And I think at a certain point, fear over just like it, you know, at some point they tune you out Mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, this guy sucks. Like he's just riding me for the sake of riding. I've heard that too in a lot of podcasts about you can, as a leader, you can lead with fear or you can lead with respect. And if you lead with fear, they'll listen to you when you're in the room, but as soon as you leave the room, they're going to turn their backs on you and start talking shit. But if you listen, if you follow with respect, then not only will they listen to you longer, but they'll listen to you when you're not there and you don't have to worry about that stuff after you leave the room. Well, I'm sure they're always going to talk shit about you as a coach (laughs) and your decisions you make, but yes, and I 100% believe that. And I also believe that with this generation of students, like obviously this generation of students is completely different than other students and other generations. And I think learning how to coach them effectively is critical to any coach's success. What makes this generation different? So a lot of it is how you, you know, this generation has grown up with their, um, obviously, you know, growing up, I didn't have any cell phone. So when you say this generation, you mean like 2000 and... So I think, I don't know when gen... So... I think right now is Generation Z is in college. And so generation... I'm, what are we, millennials? You guys might be millennials. I think I was 2003, so I think I'm a millennial. But so obviously you guys have grown up with cell phones. Yeah. You've grown up with, um, you know, more information at hand than any other time. Like I think it, like when I was growing up, my coach was the expert, right? Like I, right now, you know, like you go on YouTube, and you can find an amazing offense that somebody else runs, you know, where you, you, I couldn't do that growing up. So like whatever my coach said, like that, that was it. And I, that's why I think you can't be power over because they can look up like, you know, say we ran the worst offense in America, which <clears throat> was pretty close, <laughs> but you know, they could look up and see like, Hey, this is what other teams are doing. Yeah. And why aren't we doing that versus, you know, cause you have the phone and the internet at your, you know, right in your pocket versus growing up, never did. Speaking of this generation, I kind of want to go into maybe more personal topic about your kids. How has having kids affected the way that you coach, if it's affected you at all? So I think I certainly don't take uh, losses home as, as I did prior. Um, prior to have kids, you know, like I slept in the office, like I kind of did those crazy, like, macho things that like coaches like have a badge of honor and you know having kids now like they don't really care how the game went you know they just want to hang out and do fun things and you know be be with me and they don't want to deal with me when I'm in a pissed off mood because you know we can't rotate or you know we can't make shots so I think that has um really helped me and you know um yeah, I don't know. On top of you said the that's like our generation thing. Do you try and foster a sense of I don't want to say belonging, but things outside of social media with your kids? Like, do you limit their screen time? Do you do those types of things? <laughs> um, I try to, but I don't do it successfully. There's a legendary story here of I was running a compliance meeting, and my wife had an an issue with the older one that she had to be at. And so it was like nine o'clock at night. I brought my youngest, and I think he was like five at the time. And he sat in the back of the library theater. I gave him a giant bag of nerds and my my iPad. <laughs> and he was completely quiet and he sat through the whole presentation, but he ate all the nerds and watched uh, whatever was on the iPad. <laughs> so 
You see, I didn't grow up with. Well, I did, but I also didn't. Chris's parents don't have cell phones. Man, my parents don't have cell phones. Don't, don't have cell phones at all? My dad is old school. Wow, that is old school. He emails people, and there's a house phone that people call him on, and he comes in between. Like, he'll go out and do the tractor stuff, come in, check the messages, go out, do that stuff. And the only way you can contact him is through that house phone. But other than Chris that, lives he, in like nine. Yeah, but that, that's, that's how it was. He's one of the happiest people I know. My, dad is, my dad is happy as fuck. There's probably a correlation. 100% yes. a correlation. That's how I grew up. You know, we all had one phone, and. You know, that was it. Like, li- growing up in the residence halls at Loomis Chafee, they had one phone for the whole, for the whole dorm. So y- you had to wait your turn. <laughs> and you literally, and it was in the hallway, so you had to, you had no privacy whatsoever. You had to sit in the hallway, and then people were just waiting there to get on the phone with you having conversations. That sounds better than what we have now, honestly. I'd prefer that so much more. <laughs> um do your kids play basketball, and is there kind of like an influence from you for them to play? Uh, my oldest plays rec, so he does the travel, and he plays basketball. Um, both of my kids are – my youngest does not right now. He's only seven. Um, but they're both of them are better at soccer. They love soccer, um, and I don't necessarily have a preference of whether they play basketball or not. I just want them to be successful and try to help them in ways that I can. Um, you know, they're also on the shorter side, so soccer might be their best sport for them. Yeah. I kind of have a running joke that I ask everybody on this podcast about if they think they could beat their dad in the driveway one on ones. I don't know if I've ever asked the actual dad if he could beat his kid in driveway one on ones. So but I, he thinks he could beat me in a one on one. Yeah, he genuinely thinks he could beat me. First of all, I, I haven't could, seen him who, so I can't say yeah. anything. He airballs form shots regularly. All right. <laughs> All I have to do is force Max left and get up on him, and he can't go anywhere. <laughs> I will have a left hand layup. I'll yeah. Have a left hand layup. <laughs> Listen, you, you don't understand. When I, you know Clayton? You met Clayton? Yeah, Arvon? I heard about the story of how you yeah, beat him. Yeah, beat him one on one. So it'd be what the same. What was the score? Uh, I think it was like 5 3. Yeah. So you played the five? Yeah. Yeah. How are you going to score? How easy? Shot fakes. He's got 50 pivots, pounds on you. Shot fakes, pivot. <laughs> I have, I, have footwork, I have footwork and pivots. Hell no. I'll just take you in the post. Yeah, Max. I wouldn't rely on your defense on that one. But offensively, I think you probably struggle. I'm not going to lie. You offensively, you think I struggle? No, he would struggle. No. There's no way you would score five points on me. Let alone. Before I score five points on you. Yeah. No way. First of all. Exactly. No way. <laughs> there's no way you would score five points on me. You, <laughs> I'm serious. Running. Like we, I would, yo, I would put follow this on you. The YouTube channel so fast. I would follow you every single attempt until you basically would just completely jack crazy shots. That's his forte, though. Just to jack crazy <laughs> shots. No, no, because I just all I have to do is put my hand near his shoulder, and because of his low release, mm-hmm. he'll struggle with getting a shot off. Even though. Yeah. I can't, I don't know how this turned into that shit on Max, but you didn't, you didn't answer the question. <laughs> can you beat your kid and drive a one on one? Yes. And yes. is there ever going to be a point where, or so are you going to quit before he can beat you, or is this just ride or die? Uh, I mean, I remember beating my dad when I was a sophomore in high school in basketball, and then that was it, and never ever did it again. Um, so I imagine at some point, like, After I will. that first loss, it's over. No, I will quit before I let oh, him beat good. me. That's like, probably a good call. Yeah. He thinks he's going to beat his kid until the day that he dies. No. Hell yeah. <laughs> no, no, because at, at, at certain point, like, they're getting stronger faster, and you're getting older and slower. Not if I take testosterone. Wow. I'm going to be that dad at the rec center getting shots up at 6 a.m. before work every day. <laughs> I how I like how that. And why. Yeah, well, you still have to doing. defend. No, that's my dad. <laughs> I'll be able to defend. I'll be able to defend. Okay. Moving back to some more serious topics. Considering you've coached a lot of good players and been in a lot of good programs, do you notice a select standout number of characteristics or traits that these great players have? So I think it goes back to the um, kind of, I call it like the ace, the attitude, the competitive stamina, and their energy. And I think most of the great players that I've coached have have those. They, you know, have that attitude that, you know, they're – obviously, I don't know if you guys have heard the term growth mindset and stuff. They have that attitude that's helping them get better. They're improving. They keep grinding. They have that competitive stamina who, you know, will come in, will get a 1,000 shots up, will come in and do all the little things that they need to to get better. You know, and they have the energy that they're not energy vampires and just bringing down, you know, the team. 
Another thing I've always been curious about with in terms of you is how you balance being an AD and a basketball coach and a dad and you do all of this stuff. How does how do you manage that time? Uh, I think I've had some experience doing it. And I think every time you do it, you get better at it. Um, there are certainly, you know, some days are busier than others. Um, and I think, you know, some things have to suffer a little bit as kind of like when I have multiple roles. I probably didn't get on the court as much this year with guys out of like outside of, you know, practices that I would have liked to, you know, kind of getting in, getting more shots up. You know, we used to do prior to, uh, you know, me being the interim, uh, we did a 20% club. So guys came in and they did the green light shooting drills every kind of day, you know, and those were the 20% of the guys that wanted to be elite guys. Another running theme we have on this podcast is getting people to tell their crazy college basketball stories. And I'm wondering if you have either a crazy college basketball story, a crazy college story, or a crazy life story in general. <laughs> I, I, I got a lot of crazy stories. Um, Not PG for the podcast? No. So when I was in college, so you guys, so we could start October 1st, okay? But then we couldn't touch a basketball till October 15th. So it was literally... Foot fires, sprints, and for two weeks, just them trying to kill you and just making it miserable. And at Springfield College, I still remember it. We had a, they have an eight story um, residence hall. Eight, oh, is Springfield College a really big school? It's, I mean, they're like maybe 5,000 students, not. Oh, that's solid. But so they have an eight story uh, residence hall, and we had to run up across and down one of the days and it was absolutely miserable you throw up did anyone throw up i don't remember anybody throw up but i just remember that this completely brain <laughs> seared into my brain of just miserable miserable stuff that they would do before the start of the basketball season if you considered adding some of that to the elms men's basketball program please don't <laughs> <laughs> well we do have our traditional five and five which, which is five what is that exactly five suicides in, in five, five minutes 30 seconds on 30 seconds off Yes, which in our best seasons, the majority of the team can pass it on the first attempt. In our unsuccess, in our less successful seasons, there are less people that can pass it. I feel like every college has that one metric thing they use to sort of measure out players in terms of cardio. Because at Madai, we had the uh, what was it called? What was the name of the park? Delaware. Delaware Run, which you had to do. It was a 1.6 mile run around the park, and you had to do it in 6 a.m. in the rain. 6 a.m. in the rain at 11. You had to get under 11:30, and I think only 11, 11. No, I thought like 11 guys got under 11:30. But me and Colby, if you beat Coach Hack's record, which was 10 something, I almost threw up trying to do it. I got like 10:20. It wasn't even close, but it was ridiculous. It was a shitty, it was terrible. And then we had to go and do a full court thing afterwards. Anyways, but. Um, Another thing I want to know is if you lost your coaching job today, what would your life look like? That's a tough question. Um, I think I would go into helping people. I think obviously some sort of field of helping, you know, like uh, my parents were teachers and educators. So, you know, if I lost my coaching job, I'd probably look to go into that field. But I think as a coach, I'm trying to help people reach their – goals and their, um, you know, kind of whatever they're reaching for. So I think I would do something similar. Um, yeah. And if you were going to look for, an, it, on the aspect of new coaches, if you were going to look for a new coaching job specifically, what would you do? Well, I want to see what happens with Joe at uh, the Celtics. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, <laughs> um, I think looking, well, one, you know, obviously I really bl believe in the mission here at Elms and love the Elms and the students we have here. But I think, you know, looking for an institution that, you know, wants to be successful, that has the drive to do that. I think obviously, you know, you have to be on – there needs to be – in order for teams to be successful at the college level, there needs to be a lot of alignment from the institution, from the athletic department – from the coaches, you know, there has to be alignment with the strength and conditioning coaches. So I think getting all those and finding places where all those are in alignment is critical. And outside of basketball related, I want to know in terms of just life, 
in your early 20s, are there things you wish you would have done to set yourself up for success later on or things that you didn't do? Not really because, so I wanted to like, you know, as I talked about when I had the conversation with the coach, I wanted to be a college basketball coach. So I took jobs. I did things that would help advance me on that path. So like, you know, my junior year, I was volunteering doing JV basketball at a college. You know, I took a job up in Lewiston, Maine, you know, um, and then obviously, you know, kept moving on to better things to put me in the position that I am here. Um, what do you kind of want to see out of me specifically next year? What are the things I need to work on and in order to be able to contribute at some degree next season? Well, I think defensively, being able to consistently guard the ball and not necessarily be a uh, pylon, on. Sorry. A, a turn <laughs> shape, a turn style. <laughs> and I think having the confidence that I'm going to be an elite shooter and creating that gravity that teams won't leave you because you're an elite shooter. And having that gravity allows you to – help other guys by just simply being on the court, but also setting screens, movement, you know, causing those breakdowns and lack of communications that a team might have coming off screens. So I think that is kind of what I'm looking for you for next year. I think I'm ready to ask Lucci's question, which we have a tradition that I stole from another podcast where we have a guest from the last podcast ask a question to the next guest, and it was Lucci, and it's goofy as fuck, but what color is the dress? What? What you color? That thing is like the blue and white or, or oh. white and gold. What color is the dress? dress? Yeah, it's, it's gold and white. Thank Fuck off. It's gold and white. Oh. Like, well, you guys colorblind? It's, it's blue and, it's blue and black. Blue and black, dude. Blue and black? There's yeah. not even a clue. There's not even, not even close. Are you standing in the dark? When you're looking at it? <laughs> like, it is golden and white. It is very, very I can't believe people see this, dude. Um, I think we're kind of nearing the end, but I still have a couple questions. Do you have any hobbies outside of basketball, per se, that, like, Let's just say we just lost by 35 to St. Joe's Maine. I would not. That's so unlike you guys. <laughs> Sorry, never mind. In a game that should have been a lot closer, we did a lot of scouting for, and we kind of just dropped dropped a bag in that game. And so, like, obviously that's extremely frustrating for you. What do you kind of do in those moments to be able to help, I guess, you go home to your family with a clear mind, not take that out on your loved ones, or like even, like, not necessarily that, but just, like, when you're when, – Shitty stuff happens. Like, what do you kind of lean to that's not basketball? Um, I well, I you know I tend to read a lot, um, and I tend to kind of read a lot about super successful coaches and successful leaders, and try to take some wisdom from them to help me be better. Um, but I think also just being grounded in you know who I am and what what I want to do you know is just helpful and you know I think one of the biggest things I've really learned is just you know we have to take time to breathe and I think when you know you're frustrated and you breathe it helps you kind of get back to your core you know kind of core and you know obviously it's not fun to get crunched by 35 at home um but, you know, you breathe and you kind of have that drive to get better and be better tomorrow. Do you have a favorite book? Um, I don't have necessarily a favorite book. But there's a lot of great books that I've read. Could you name a few? Um, I think one of the, you know, I think um, one of the books I'm reading right now is Turn Your Ship Around. And it's about a military commander. And I can't remember his name right now, but he took over the worst performing battleship in the United States Army. I'm not sorry, on Navy. And it, within three years, he had it turned around, and it was the best performing naval ship in the country. That's one of them. Um, I've just recently read um, Super Communicators, um, which is obviously a book to try to help you communicate better. And is I that think by? Uh, Charles Dweg, he's the author of um, Building Habits. Atomic Habits? 
No, that's uh, James Clear. Okay, I thought I had a connection there, but I don't know who that is. <laughs> um, but I try to like out of out of season. I try to read a lot just to kind of help me improve. I think it's critical that I improve as a coach if I'm asking my players to improve on their weaknesses. I need to be better at communicating, better at how I'm coaching. So I think that's one of the ways that I try to be better as a coach. Mm. I'm looking over the list. I think we might have run the well dry. I don't know if I have anything else. I think we can kind of just wrap it up. Uh, what's one piece of advice you kind of give to your younger self? Keep going. You know, have, like I said, I don't, like, I kind of knew what I wanted to do early on in my life, and I put myself in position to do that. You know, and I didn't, luckily, I was able to, take some jobs that necessarily didn't have high in pay, like highest pay, but it put me on a path to where I wanted to be. And so I just think learning what you want to do and putting yourself on that path and, you know, working towards that. Awesome. Raps. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you guys. Mm-hmm.